good afternoon and good morning uh, for those in Asia and actually good evening uh, for those on the East Coast. Uh, I'm Giyuk Shin, uh, Director of the Schoenstein Asia Pacific uh, Research Center uh, here at Stanford. I'm really happy to welcome you all uh, to celebrate the publication of a book uh, based on our previous conference. Uh, this book uh, is a collection of the papers uh, presented at the Stanford Hallim Asia Pacific Innovation Conference in Chuncheon, uh, Korea on June 2019. That conference was part of our ongoing Asia Pacific Innovation Project uh, at our center with aims to produce academic and policy research that will help promote innovation and entrepreneurship in Asia. In this project, uh, we have examined the industrial organization of business and innovation clusters and how such environments affect uh, entrepreneurship. We also studied the impact of public education and financial policies pursued by East Asian countries to promote innovation and entrepreneurship. So actually two more books are first coming and we are going to have one uh, book uh, event uh, uh, sometime uh, in the spring. So hopefully uh, you can join us uh, there as well. At the 2019 conference and also in this book, uh, we focus on examining innovation, technology and demographic changes. As the population of many Asian countries is aging rapidly, it is now more important and relevant than ever to better understand the relationship between aging and uh, innovation. In this book, uh, experts uh, examine the impact of aging on the social and economic landscape and discuss the ways in which population aging and technology can influence each other. So I really hope that you enjoy our presentation and discussion of today's panel. So thank you very much uh, for joining us. Now, uh, let me talk to Karen. Great, thank you very much, Giwuk, and thank you all very much for joining us today for a discussion about demographics and innovation in the Asia Pacific. Before I introduce the book of that name and the authors who will be sharing their chapters, it's my honor to introduce Dr. James Liang, joining us uh, from China to talk about demographics and innovation in that country. We invited Dr. Liang to give a keynote address at the book conference in Korea a year and a half ago, graciously hosted by Dr. Park at Hallam University. Unfortunately, Dr. Liang was not available in 2019 to give that keynote in Korea. So we're doubly delighted that he is available to share his insights with us today. Although we'll have to leave for another meeting um, before the end of the webinar. So just briefly, James Liang is one of the co-founders and executive chairman of the board and served as chief executive officer of trip.com group, which is going to be, become one of the world's largest online travel agencies. He also serves on the boards of, of a number of other companies and is a research professor of economics at Peking University. In addition to his own experience with entrepreneurship and innovation, he's also a leading scholar of demographics and innovation in China and global perspective, including several publications about the adverse effects of demographic changes on China's economy. His latest book published in 2018 is entitled The Demographics of Innovation. Dr. Yang received his PhD in economics from Stanford University. Dr. Yang, welcome back to Stanford and over to you. Well, thank you for that introduction and nice meeting all of you. Uh, um, I'm very eager to read your research and the book. <clears throat> so I've been doing, uh, actually I spent a lot of time trying to persuade the government to give up one child policy and start uh, you know, pro-fertility policies in the last 10 years. And of course the biggest reason is innovation. Um, all the other effects on economy is actually secondary um, compared to the importance of um, its effect on innovation. Um, that's why I wrote uh, a recent paper pub published on JP with my um, uh, co-authors um, and including my advisor, Lazia. 
and it seems to be uh, will become a bigger and bigger topic, especially the race between China and U.S. Uh, innovation. I mean, I'll call it a race, not a, not a competition, uh, not a you know, war, oh, I some people call it a war. But I think it's not a zero sum game, but that's why I call it a race. Um, I certainly hope that US and China will, you know, in a healthy competition or healthy race. <clears throat> but this seems the biggest topic going forward in, the, in this century. And I recently did some collab, you know, calibration and prediction from the perspective of the human resource. Uh, basically, how much talent you can throw out, how many, how many talents that's relevant uh, in comparing the uh, innovation power or innovation uh, human resource uh, between the US and China. So the, I, I gave you the short conclusion. Uh, you can see the slide, right? Uh, China will continue to outpace and surpass the US <clears throat> in the race in the next 10, 20 years. But in the long run, it depends on two factors. So China, uh, whether or not China can have more babies and the uh, US will continue to be able to attract immigration. So I'll lay out some of the key evidence. Now currently China is actually catching up the US very quickly in terms of the publication by one metric that China is actually already published more papers, scientific papers uh, than US as of now. Uh, the, the blue line, the US and the yellow line, China, and certainly these two countries actually is far outgrown all the other countries because of their uh, advantage in the talent pool. And China is by far the fastest and they will continue to do so in the, in the next few years. And also by uh, the percentage of spent as a share of our GDP, uh, China is very close to US. And if the percentage is close, of course, China is still slightly smaller in terms of the nominal or uh, in terms of real GDP than US, but the China's labor cost or this, the salary they pay to scientists is only you know, a third or quarter of that of US. So in terms of number of people, number of researchers engaged in R&D, China has already surpassed the US. I so thought quantity is not everything. We can also look at the quality a little bit. I mean, it's very hard to measure quality. You know, I, I use a very rough proxy, as, you know, quality of the college graduates. I use a, 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 a very uh, crude proxy, uh, which is uh, uh, how many PhD students were uh, awarded by the best university, which is mostly in the US, by country. So, so, of course, adjusted by the, by the population of that country. So in China, uh, <clears throat> assuming all the, all the best college graduates will apply to the U.S. graduate schools. So if you look at this graph on the, on the right, for every million population, China sends about four PhD students to the U.S. colleges. And that's the highest among all the other countries. Germany is second for every million German Germany sends about two PhD students to, to the US. And the third is UK, the fourth is India, and uh, followed by other developed countries and all the other developed countries is like far behind. So in terms of number, uh, for, for this perspective, China, the, the college graduates in China is just as high quality as any other country, probably higher. So in terms of quantity and quality, China is also uh, very high and China has four times uh, the number of population of the US. Uh, so uh, uh, it's certainly currently, it's doing very well benefiting from its huge talent pool. And also uh, the quality of the talent, talent pool is very good. But China has, of course, you know, this very severe, probably the most severe low fertility problem. And I, I, can share, I can share with you some of the latest data. Latest data, China's fertility rate is probably the lowest in the world, probably on par with that of Korea, which is the lowest in the world in the past, has been. But uh, China is probably um, the same level as Korea, just close to one. And recently the number of new births last year 
is dropped to close to 10 million by some estimate. And uh, a generation ago, it's about 25 million. So it's reduced by more than half in just one generation. And that trend is continued. So China is a, a very drastic demographic cliff, if you want to call it. So you, can, you see a very different pattern if you look at the, the overall number of work, uh, overall population and the young population. The young population is going to decline much faster or much sooner than the overall population. And the yellow line is the uh, young workers. So the young worker will peak around, actually it's already started to decline. Uh, right now it's uh, uh, start to decline. The number of young workers, the overall workforce will decline in about in the next several years. So let's look at the U.S. So U.S. Of, of course, is only have a one quarter of the population. The U.S. has one big advantage: is has this. Uh, it can tap into the talents, the global talent pool. So how much does that affect? How much the U.S. is magnifying the talent pool through its immigration? Uh, this is. A, Difficult to measure, the South Coast is a very difficult measure. But I once used one very crude proxy to just look at what share of the top scientists and entrepreneurs are of the immigration, um, you know, not born in the US, basically are immigrants. Uh, that number is actually uh, widely studied and available. So if, if you look at the engineering and science major uh, doctoral students in engineering and science major, actually that number is close to half. It's 45, 47%. Computer science, 45%. Engineering is 47%. So it's roughly half the doctoral students in top in major universities actually are immigrants. <clears throat> actually, if, if you look at entrepreneurs, that number is also close to 30, 40%. So if you use a rough estimate about half, of the, actually basically by uh, attracting immigrants, the US is actually doubling its talent pool. So it's not just tapping to the three, 400 million uh, US population, it's actually tapping to probably uh, seven, 800 million population, double its own size. So US has this uh, um, immigration effect. So yeah, just for the immigration effect, basically uh, you actually US is much closer to China in terms of talent pool. So yeah, okay, let's look at China again. Even though China is the young population is already started to decline, but China is still on a, a very strong inertia of quality increase in terms of talent pool because uh, the people who are exiting the workforce or pe people are getting old uh, in China, which is you know, 45 years or 60 year old, they are, have a much lower education compared to the people, young people entering the workforce because China only 10 years ago or 15 years ago started to expand college education rapidly. So that initiative still continue will, uh, will benefit uh, China for the next few years. So if you just look at uh, the young college graduates, the top line is the overall number of young people and uh, the bottom line is just look at the college graduates. So the, just look at the young college graduates, you will see um, it will, China will continue to have more and more co young college graduates until it tops out around uh, 2040, which is about 20 years from now. So we, we compare the young college graduates between US and China, uh, and US with this doubling effect of, um, uh, from, from the immigration effect. And the, uh, the, the blue line is the U.S. talent pool. And the yellow line is the, the number of uh, young college graduates in China. And you can see right now, uh, China is just recently overtook U.S. And it's still going in, in a stage of rapid rise. And until 2040, and that's why when China will reach its peak in terms of human resource and, uh, and then the U.S. is continue to increase at a steady level. Uh, yeah, so that, that's how I reach this conclusion that in the short run, that China will continue to do very well. And in the long run, a generation program, uh, U.S. is going to catch up with China. Um, well, it's, it's, you know, put it in the very succinctly, <clears throat> because China has four times the population of the U.S., 
Uh, but the U.S. can tap into uh, the world talents pool by its uh, by immigration, so it actually effectively doubling its talent pool. So the advantage is not four times; it's really only two times. And China is actually shrinking in terms of young number of new births by each by half for each generation. So a generation from now, China's advantage will disappear. The China is going to be uh, real, almost the same. Uh, similar size in terms of talent pool a generation from now. And China will continue this shrinking trend going forward. So by another generation, by another 10, 20 years, uh, actually the US is probably gonna have more talent pool, effective talent pool in innovation. And that's when the US is gonna recapture the lead leadership in terms of uh, uh, um, innovation. So that's a, a short conclusion. So just in summary, China will continue to outpace and surpass the US in the next 20, 20 years. But in the long run, a generation or 20 or 30 years from now, if China cannot uh, solve its uh, low fertility problem and US will con continue to uh, attract talents around the world and the US will retake the leadership 10 or 20, uh, 20 30 years from now. Uh, that's my uh, uh, conclusion. Great, thank what, you very much. Anybody, any of our other panelists have a question for Dr. Liang? Just unmute yourself and ask if you do. So I suppose I have one question and the one of the issues with the, the answer of trying to have more babies is that um, you have two two things that are hard about that, which is the, the, the cohorts that are entering their fertile years are getting smaller. And so, you know, even if you went to a TFR of two overnight, that presents some problems. And then the second problem is that babies don't enter the labor force immediately. So, you know, you really, um, how do you think about the problem with lags? And I'm not sure we're gonna be around, uh, you know, unless life extension happens, I'm not sure that we're necessarily gonna be around to see how all this plays out. But, um, but how do you think about the problem of this inertia that the low birth cohorts are necessarily gonna produce pretty low small birth cohorts themselves, even if total fertility rates get back up mm -hmm. to um, reasonable levels? Yeah, it will not stop at uh, the 10 million mark. It will continue to on a downward trajectory of uh, you know, roughly shrinking um, by half for each generation. So it continue to go down. But other countries, developed countries uh, will have the same problem. Um, China will, I think uh, in a few years will realize this problem. Chinese government will have very um, drastic measures to try to solve this problem. Uh, which country can solve this problem better is gonna have the advantage. It looks like Asia Pacific, North Asia will have the most serious problem because it doesn't have immigration and like um, the, the US and the Europe have you know, ability to, yeah, or intention to have more immigration. The second is um, just uh, the, the education um, pressure uh, to get in place like Stanford is just too stressful and burdensome for the parents. Uh, these two unique problems probably will uh, make the problems in China and Korea and Japan worse. Uh, Japan is actually doing better than, much better than uh, China and Korea and, you know, Singapore, Hong Kong. Of course, Singapore, Hong Kong um, can attract, uh, you know, the immigrants. That's not a big issue for these smaller places. <clears throat> uh, but, you know, Korea and China will have a, the worst problem in the world. So, so but China, you know, See who can solve this problem better. You know, everybody is going to be on a downward trajectory, even US and, and Korea. But uh, with you know, uh, the North Asia will have the most serious problem. <laughs> Thank you. So there was also a question submitted about the relationship between demographics and um, just the population on the planet and uh, climate change. So you could think about innovation to address that challenge and how it interacts with demographics. Do you have any comments on that? I know you have to go soon. But... Well, on the world level, the, the population is actually quite stable. Mm -hmm. So I think the world will have another 50 years of a stable population. Um, so by, by then, <laughs> we hopefully 
uh, we, uh, the, 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 the minds uh, and the, the innovative minds of the world will, 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 will you know, more or less solve the problem. And, uh, you know, you hopefully will come from the uh, China will be, a, will, will, and then Asia will be a, a big part of it, right? For its innovation power and also for its uh, manufacturing capabilities. Uh, so I, I, I think it's probably two independent problems. The, 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 the problem facing Asia and the world are having a very different, uh, very different problems. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you Great. very much. We really appreciate your joining us today, Dr. Liang. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me and look forward to uh, the book. Congratulations. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, to introduce the rest of our panelists for today, I want to first just show you the book um, and talk briefly about the contents of the book, Demographics and Innovation in the Asia Pacific. It's co-edited uh, myself, Giwak Shin, and Junsik Park. So uh, we talk about the importance of uh, changing demographics in the introduction and the talk about the purpose of the book analyzing the effect of Asia's demographic change on shaping both the supply and the demand side of innovation in comparative perspective. So the first section of the book looks at demographics, productivity, and the labor supply of older workers. In addition to the chapter you are hear in a minute from uh, James Ferrer, there is also a chapter on China, actually that I wrote, because Dr. Lang couldn't write, write it, and then one about changing cognitive performance among older people in Japan, and sectoral shift, technological change in older labor, comparing the US and Korea. And the next part of the book looks at technology age structure and the political economy of innovation. And we'll hear more about that from uh, Kenji Kushida's chapter about Japan and uh, Professor Park who's talking about his chapter about uh, Korea. Um, the others, we won't have time to talk today. Uh, there's information about each of the contributors and the panelists today on our website, so I won't go into great detail, but just to mention, um, next we'll be hearing from James Fair, who is Associate Professor of Economics at Dartmouth College. He received his PhD from Brown and his BS from Stanford. His work is primarily in applied macroeconomics and he's published in most of the leading journals in economics as well as impacted policy in this area. Professor Junshik Park will be talking next. He's professor in the Department of Sociology at Hallam University and focuses his research on employment and regional studies. He has served as president of the Korean Regional Sociological uh, Association and dean of the Social Science School at Hallam and is now a member of the Presidential Commission on Policy Planning of the Korean government. And our last panelist will be Kenji Kushida, who's our own research scholar at Shoren's team APARC in the Japan program, does research on multiple different streams and has a PhD in political science from UC Berkeley and several degrees from Stanford. So there are only two people who don't have degrees from Stanford, that's Professor Park and myself. <laughs> so now, Jim Fair, over to you. Excellent. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, let me share some slides. I uh, What I want to talk about today is uh, links to some earlier work I did about a decade ago on demographics and productivity um, worldwide. Um, but I, I want to start with, um, I, I was at, at the lovely conference we had in Korea, I had a chance to, to spend a couple of days in Seoul. And um, I saw this lovely, lovely street mural, which I thought encompassed a lot of what we were going to be talking about of the uh, these two two folks kissing, two, these two youngsters kissing um, and uh, on a street in Korea. So what I want to talk about today is going to focus on the impact of the aging populations in Asia and how that is going to impact basically aggregate productivity. And so this is just a graph that I think is quite familiar. It's, it's regionally uh, the median age um, over time. 
And the main things I want to point out is obviously median ages are, are rising around the world and they're rising rapidly. Um, they're rising more rapidly in East Asia than any other, any other region in the globe, although they're rising fairly rapidly in Europe and Latin America and North America. And the red line is sort of the end of our data. And, and the one thing I would like to focus on is that the median ages that we're going to be seeing in the future are higher than any median ages we've seen before. So we're really in uncharted territory. So back in 1970, the oldest regions in the world had median ages of 30. We're at a period where region, median ages have moved to 40 and median ages are going to do nothing but go up to 50 or 60, depending on what happens with birth rates. Now, as I said, I've, I've got some previous work that looks at uh, the relationship between the age profile of the workforce and uh, productivity. And the main finding is that a large cohort of prime age workers, and by that I mean the 40 to 50 year old cohort, is positively associated with um, higher productivity. And so if you've got a lot of young workers, that's a relatively low productivity profile. And if you have a lot of old workers, that's a relatively old productivity profile as well. And, and so workforces that are, are kind of either skewed young or skewed old tend to have uh, take a productivity hit for that. And so if we look regionally at the proportion of workers aged between 40 and 49 around the globe, we see that East Asia has seen between 1980 and basically right about now has seen a very large increase in the size of that cohort. That, that cohort's gotten bigger over time as those populations have aged. Europe saw a lot of that aging ending at about 2000. The US actually, because of the baby boom plays such an outsized role in the United States, the United States actually saw that 40 year old cohort peak in about 1970. And the, the message I want you to take away from here is that when these lines are going up, that's providing uh, demographic tailwinds to productivity. And when these lines are going down, it's providing demographic tailwinds to productivity. Um, and so for North America, the, uh, you saw like sort of 80s and into the 90s was a very positive period for this, but then the 2000s were, uh, were less so. Asia from about 1980 until, um, until about 2010 was getting very positive uh, demographic uh, tailwinds in terms of these demographics. Now, key thing about this, and, and just to give you some idea of how big these are, um, for Korea, the results suggest that Korea was picking up an additional 1% of growth every single year between 1970 and 2000 due to the, the, um, the age profile moving from being very young to the age pro profile being middle-aged. Now, Korea obviously is moving into a profile where they're going to be getting older over time, and Korea is actually poised to give back about half those gains over the next 30 years as aging reduces the size of that prime age cohort. Um, and the other thing to remember in Europe is that there's a lot of heterogeneity um, among the different countries within, within Asia, excuse me. And, and, and I really grouped them into three groups. You've got a group like Japan, Singapore, Taiwan, Korea, that all went through a relatively early demographic transition and um, are basically at the end of that transition in some sense. And then you've got Malaysia, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, Myanmar that are have just gone through the demographic transition. And then India, Indonesia, Laos, Cambodia, the Philippines, and Papua New Guinea that are have not quite hit the demographic transition, but will definitely be hitting it soon. And so you kind of have these early transitioners that are exiting a period of growth where demographics have provided a boost to productivity growth. And they are about to or are already in a period where uh, demographics is actually uh, negative for them in terms of productivity. We've got a group of recent transitioners um, that are currently experiencing a, a boost of productivity growth. And we have the pre-transition -tra economies that are poised to move into that, that era of roughly 30 years where uh, the demographic changes are going to be very good for them. Um, now, as I said, the paper I wrote back in 2007 suggested that the aging of the higher income Asian nations are gonna, is gonna put a downward pull on productivity over the next 30 years. But one of the things I did in my book chapter was I updated that paper with new data. So bringing the data up to, um, up to 2018, 2019. And one of, the, one of the findings of this new paper is that the negative consequences of an old workforce are getting weaker over 
over time. So adding that additional 15 years of data resulted in the negative pull of the old workforce being a little less of a strong result while the young cohort results uh, remain just as strong as they were. And that's good news, potentially. Um, it suggests these older cohorts may be exerting less of a negative pull over time. Um, why would that be the case? Well, I, I'd like to make the case that um, old cohorts are getting healthier and in better shape. And a lot of that goes all the way back to their youth. And so there's a number of papers that suggest that things like vaccination, sanitation, food fortification at childhood um, leads to lifetime improvements in health and well-being. And a lot of that focus is actually on in utero health. And so lots of things that happened 70 years ago are going to impact the productivity of 70 year olds now. And if you look at some of the results from this, um, the famous Flynn effect where IQ in the United States is going up at something like three points per decade are consistent with this idea that your, um, what you're seeing when you're young is going to impact your health and uh, your cognitive skills when you are older. And there's a nice paper that suggests that the Flynn effect actually might explain a lot of the differences in cognitive skills between 25 and 70 year olds. So you might think that 25 and 70 year olds have different cognitive skills because of cognitive decline among the 70 year olds. And it may just be that overall cognitive skills are just increasing over time due to these increasing, um, increasing nutrition. Um, and so that suggests the older workforce of the future and even of today might actually be quite different in ways that impact productivity. Um, and so to, to keep this short, uh, I, my main conclusions are a large prime age cohort is positively associated with productivity and output. Over the last 30 years, the high income Asian nations that had early demographic transitions have had higher productivity growth due to that. And they are uh, potentially about to have that reverse many of the lower income Asian nations are actually about to get a demographic boost to productivity. So the news is not all bad for the aging that a lot of the nations are about to go into the good period. Um, and there's some reasons to think that the predictions around this aging might not hold because we might think that uh, the workforce is getting better over time. And as I said, the aggregate evidence actually suggests that the aging, um, the older workers are, are have less of a negative pull over time. And the, the final thing I, I'd like to leave us with here, and I think this is just a theme for everything we're going to talk about today, which is that the demographic configurations that we're going to see in Western Europe and East Asia over the next 20 and 30 years are have never been seen in human history. Uh, we've never seen rich, healthy societies with falling populations. We've never seen median ages in any societies be over 40, let alone at 50. And, and so I, I, I always have a bit of caution about making any predictions because we really are moving outside of the realm of what we've seen in the data. So I, I'm always a little bit reticent to uh, make strong predictions, or at least I'd like, I always like to caveat those predictions with the idea that we are in un unknown territory. The one thing that does give me some hope is that um, countries like Japan, it, the countries that are going through it first are rich and highly educated. And so I think we're going to learn an awful lot um, from Japan over the next 10 to 15 years about what Korea is going to go through and about what a lot of other nations around the globe are going to go through. Thank you so much. And next to talk about that transition, the early transition, um, country group, we have Professor Park, who's also co-editor of the whole volume, and we'll talk about his chapter on how society is adjusting to population aging and its interaction with innovation. Professor Park, welcome. Over to you. Thank you very much. I'm extremely excited to uh, have an opportunity to participate in this conference uh, uh, whom I met two years ago. Uh, well, I'm very much honored uh, for having been able to uh, have some contribution for the publication of this book. Uh, today, I would like to uh, just uh, summarize some of the main themes of my uh, uh, paper included in, uh, in this book, and also wanted to share some of my thoughts on the uh, impl policy implications and also uh, possible uh, future choices we may take for the uh, uh, thriving future of uh, uh, Korean society, including East Asian uh, societies, societies too. 
I think the, uh, Korea is uh, uh, undergoing uh, uh, the greatest population challenges uh, we have never seen in the history of our society. And as we, it is well known that one of the most fundamental issues threatening the future of Korean society uh, is uh, diminishing birth rate and also too fast aging. Uh, well, these two uh, trends, population trends, are the uh, uh, phenomena of a, a two different sides of the coin. Uh, and I think the, those two uh, forces are the, perhaps the most uh, uh, serious uh, uh, problem we uh, Korean societies will face in the near future. Uh, and this kind of uh, challenges or uh, this kind of uh, uh, turning point of a population shift has dramatically begun uh, sometime around 10 years ago when uh, Korean society uh, was hit with a uh, serious uh, uh, economic crisis which was called IMF uh, crisis two, uh, 20 years ago. And uh, around that time, the birth rate of Korean society has plunged deeply, uh, well, which uh, began to signal the, the future crisis we are now facing nowadays. And also 10 years ago, uh, we uh, also uh, suffered a similar kind of economic crisis and which was called global financial crisis. And also uh, around that time too, uh, we had a significant drop on the uh, well, birth rate of Korean society. So two consecutive uh, economic crises, which we had to suffer to, uh, uh, at, at the span of 10 years had, had huge impacts on every uh, corners of Korean society in terms of population. The continuing waves of diminishing birth rate uh, are now uh, seems to be uh, uncoverable, unrecoverable. And so this kind of uh, uh, well, uh, birth rate dec decrease will continue structurally. And now Korea uh, hit, last year hit the uh, lowest point, which is the uh, one uh, below the one point, uh, uh, percent of, of birth rate uh, last year. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, now we are uh, facing uh, various kinds of domino-like uh, collapse impacts on every corner of Korean society, which is, is hidden behind the splendid economic achievement of Korean societies. But our local communities, small towns and medium cities are now suffering from uh, various kinds of uh, uh, well, community collapse phenomena, and uh, except uh, uh, the only capital area, which is called uh, Seoul metropolitan area. So the more only exception of negative effect on the decreasing, fast decreasing of uh, birth rate is uh, Seoul metropolitan area. But except that area, other uh, well, regions and locals, small cities and communities are now already facing uh, various kinds of serious community issues. And we wanted to examine how uh, we can identify this kind of uh, uh, issues by looking at the two indicators. One is community schools, and second one is local hospitals. Uh, as we, as is well known, uh, school and community is one of the fundamental uh, well, pillars which support the existence uh, and the growth or maintain uh, reproductibility of community life in every uh, well human societies. But uh, well, if uh, especially uh, community schools are very important for Korean society because most of the Korean people and communities uh, uh, value very highly uh, the education. So so. Uh, if a community lose educational basis of the future generation, the uh, community itself will face uh, ultimate uh, you know, disappearance. And I think this kind of uh, uh, phenomena are, are happening all around the uh, well, peripheries of Korean societies. And we can uh, see those kind of problems uh, well, uh, especially serious, uh, especially at first in local area, uh, local 
uh, rural areas. But nowadays, we are also uh, witnessing that kind of impact in small communities, even in medium-sized uh, towns. And this kind of population shift uh, are, are giving us uh, some uh, another social, uh, well, uh, social and political or policy challenges. I think that this is the political side of the pol uh, political uh, political side of uh, population decrease, which means that uh, diminishing, you know, you know uh, population population basis among regions and locals and cities and towns and great metropolitan areas uh, uh, will ultimately uh, 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 be a one of the uh, serious source of, of social unevenness. Now we are uh, witnessing a wider, uh, widespread unevenness among different spatial uh, areas in Korean societies. Uh, well, the, this, uh, this uh, will transform itself into a, a, a possible political tensions among regions and also locals, even among uh, different generations. And uh, uh, we should uh, uh, pay attention to the possible, possible political uh, issues related uh, with the reproduction of a community and also unevenness among different social spaces. And uh, uh, this kind of uh, social tensions will be ultimately uh, add one of the, uh, well, uh, another uh, issues for the future of Korean uh, societies. And then we need to think about what would be the possible alternative. Actually, the uh, range of choices seem to be extremely narrow. Uh, well, insofar as Korean society wants to stay in existing social patterns. And also, uh, we are now uh, uh, spending uh, well, a huge amount of money on uh, curbing. Uh, this kind of social trend uh, in the name of uh, uh, preventing uh, uh, policy measures on uh, on the uh, on low uh, birth rate or uh, fast uh, aging, but uh, those kind of huge spending or policy measures seems to be not so uh, effective in uh, well when we compared with the well family planning issues we are uh, we had in during industrialization period and it is too costly and also uh, the uh, real effect seems to be very meager so uh, well uh, we need to think over different kind of ways uh, well in uh, uh, and also uh, different kind of policy measures or social innovations for making or reviving communities more attractive for the, the people uh, who uh, are uh, for the uh, for the people in the in the future, and also we would like to uh, mention about uh, amenities, uh, with living environment, or uh, well, also transforming lifestyles of the uh, people, uh, or for making uh, community lives more uh, more attractive and effective for. Uh, those people living in uh, uh, urban areas, or uh, we may uh, uh, try to redesign our life uh, lifestyles. Uh, for for uh, for example, uh, maintaining uh, two residential sites, uh, including rural and also uh, urban areas. Uh, whatever those kind of social innovations innovations may be, uh, uh, various kinds of uh, experimental measures or the experimental programs or policies are uh, well, happening around the Korean uh, well, spaces. But uh, it, uh, well, it remains to be seen whether those kind of uh, endogenous, endogenous uh, social uh, innovations uh, will uh, uh, in some, uh, make uh, significant social uh, changes for enhancing uh, or for buttressing uh, or for the sinking down of local area due to the, uh, the uh, historical low birth rate of Korean society. But uh, anyway, uh, well, this would be a really, really uh, well, a challenging issue, not only for Korean society, but also ultimately uh, for the future of uh, uh, 
well, uh, most of the societies which we will, uh, uh, will face uh, similar kind of uh, population shifts uh, in, the, in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Park, and for sharing that important perspective from Korea and from sociology. We have multiple disciplines looking at this question in multiple societies. And the next perspective comes from Japan and importantly talking about technology as part of the innovation to address demographic change. So Kenji Kushida, welcome and over to you. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm honored to be part of this. Uh, and in true Japanese fashion, I need to start with an apology. The apology is that I'm going to go quite fast, but the good news is that the book chapter, once it's out, the book uh, can go much slower. So I will go ahead and share my slides. And so how Japan's aging uh, demographics is shaping pathways of technological development. Uh, so the overview, of course, is that Japan has been facing an extreme aging and shrinking population. And in order to sustain a high standard of living, the working population has to increase its productivity. And this is often well accomplished through technological progress. And uh, the demographics of Japan's aging society that's been so rapid, uh, especially recently in its effects, has galvanized a wide range of corporate efforts supported both directly and indirectly by the government to develop AI-driven technologies and various systems to perform work for which labor shortages are accelerating. Uh, so a quick note on technological progress, because technological development doesn't occur in a vacuum. The context matters. And in this case, the demographic context can shape trajectories very powerfully, as we will see. And technological diffusion is dependent on factors other than the technology itself. So it's not, in this case, just an exogenous something that's going to come in and spread out. The context will help shape it. If we look back at Japan, particularly in IT, it had a specific problem. Uh, it was leading in many areas, uh, mobile phones, etc., leading, but without global followers. Uh, it was great for the Japanese market. The Japanese market became very sophisticated, but the Japanese market is big, but not big enough. And so it led to isolation and then later disruption versus uh, historical experience with automobile semiconductors when domestic competition was a springboard into global markets. What I'm going to suggest here is Japan, as Jim mentioned earlier, is hitting these demographic milestones and situation earlier than the other many other places. And so it can be a leader with followers in this area. A uh, couple drivers of significance. Let's get specific. Demographics can be a market opportunity of an unprecedented scale to serve the needs of the rapidly aging society. It can, uh, some other mechanisms are acute labor shortage in particular areas. The, uh, there were even, even during the pandemic because it didn't hit Japan as seriously, uh, acute labor shortages remained. Uh, and then political favorite, favorable political and regulatory dynamics where rather than political opposition from displacing people, uh, political tailwinds for uh, using various technologies to do the work for which there aren't enough people. Uh, this helped a lot of deployment, experimentation and diffusion. And so we're gonna go into specific uh, examples in a second. Uh, of course, some of the specifics that we should go into are the population shrinking overall, and then households, aging households, households with aged residents and elderly living alone, and then rising health costs and additional needs and rural areas are among the most impacted. And then again, labor shortages. Uh, a quick uh, a theoretical note on social science and industry because industry needs and opportunities is a perspective that is often missing in various types of social science. We need to, in many cases, actually look at the specific market opportunities of concrete firms to see how they develop and uh, benefit from technology embedded solutions. And it's these solutions that shape lots of aspects of society. So firms can't really be abstracted away in uh, many of the important ways that we look at this. So let's take Japan's demographics and slice it in specific ways to show specific pain points, which are industry opportunities. Uh, so for example, the demographic pattern of uh, number of households with one or more member over age 65. So these are households with aging residences. This is 41% of all households in 2015, uh, more now. And of course, those kinds of households have will incur needs for home elder care. So some of the specific needs include specific information needs about caring for the elderly, what you need to do, the need for physically supporting movements of the elderly, desire to pursue employment for the caretakers because they're usually family members, while 
taking care of the elderly, another aging residents living alone. This is different from the family uh, in some ways because they are living alone. Uh, the numbers are rather incredible. By 2040, 25% of women and 21% of women over 65 are projected to be living alone. So specific needs include uh, healthcare, communications with family or relatives, managing logistics of home and care, physicians, da daily life activities, mobility within the home and around the community, entertainment and pastimes for a mental and emotional well-being, specific needs. Uh, and aging is very acute in the rural areas. For example, projected by 2045, the proportion of residents over age 65 will be a little bit over half in Akita Prefecture and 46% in Aomori. And uh, Tokyo and Osaka's proportions are 30 to 36%. So uh, this is hitting uh, uh, very severely. So addressing some of the labor shortages, uh, so here's some what firms have been doing. For example, Komatsu introduced various systems of upskilling to allow inexperienced workers to perform high-skilled jobs. Uh, you, need to, you used to have to have 10 years of experience to do particular cuts using these machines, but with the uh, intelligence augmentation, you could actually be your first day off of uh, just getting a license to operate it, and you can do these very complicated cuts uh, by having machine-assisted um, operations. And you're not displacing workers uh, who can then, through unions or political forces, oppose because there weren't enough people. So uh, Komatsu rushed to implement this in Japan, and then they're taking it globally. Uh, so, so, so various sensors and things that um, enable upskilling. And uh, Komatsu also partnered with a, a Silicon Valley company uh, making drones and uh, using 3D maps from the drones to do surveying of construction sites. So there was a dramatic reduction in the time and labor intensity of taking measurements. It used to take two weeks to survey. You've probably seen them with uh, tripods and people with uh, taking measurements uh, down to about two hours. Again, this would have displaced a lot of small medium firms, except there weren't enough people in these firms. So uh, everybody, including the government was strongly uh, uh, cheerleading these efforts. Uh, transportation. Japan's commercial drivers are aging, creating pressure to make uh, viable automated driving and diverse methods to increase the productivity of existing drivers. If we look average bus driver age 50, taxi driver average age 59, truck 48, uh, proportion of women is extremely low. So uh, there's uh, there are some labor issues. So things like uh, truck convoy technology, where there's somebody driving the front truck and the uh, two trucks behind it are just following automated. This had full government support. They used uh, the, to do this in um, freeways. A lot of red tape that had been preventing this kind of thing was cut through to be able to try to commercialize these because the trucking industry had a severe labor shortage. And uh, others, so sort of aut autonomous buses for because there weren't enough bus drivers in regional areas. And so some test cases in public roads that happened and they became more and more sophisticated and they're still going on now. Uh, digitization of healthcare. So there was an interesting and uh, uh, unfortunate imbalance. Japan had far more medical imaging hardware like MRIs and CT scan machines than people who could read them in rural areas in Japan, which meant that people were getting CT scans and MRIs, but then often doctors would not be able to catch uh, things that were then lethal cancer or su such. So a company was set up, and this is an example, uh, to basically hire doctors in a city to work like a regular nine to five job and then diagnose remotely. And the government allowed this to happen. Uh, and they discovered that female doctors, particularly with younger children, they had, a lot of them had left the profession of medicine. and They became the major workforce of this service. And so they were the least likely to actually demographically work at small medium clinics in rural areas. So all of a sudden this matching uh, from severe demand was starting to happen. And this, this was actually a startup and it started to uh, uh, deploy its service. Uh, Obayashi, a construction company partnered with the Silicon Valley uh, uh, company for to make and deploy powered clothing. And it's to design to augment human strength. Uh, and so basically as uh, construction workers were aging, you put on one of these powered suits and you can uh, pick up heavier things, you get less tired, etc. So industry specific. And of course there are uh, domestic healthcare applications of this and that's what they're starting to look into. So a few other, just a couple more things. Uh, mental health and getting data from it. There are mental commitment robots like this cute little furry uh, seal that has sensors all over it. Uh, it has some AI built in and it responds to patients with various uh, types of uh, dementia and some studies, government funded studies are under 
underway and private firms are looking into commercialize this kind of thing. Uh, another example for dementia, uh, uh, human-like uh, controlled androids that then uh, people can speak on the back end. And apparently if you have a certain degree of dementia, then you can project who you want to see on the face of this. And uh, uh, these kinds of experiments are uh, moving forward. Robotic dog uh, was very popular, discontinued once, it came back uh, and it's now has AI, so it uh, le learns from each of its owners, various characteristics. It also added a watchdog feature, so it can have sensors if and listen if there's a big uh, thud, if somebody falls over uh, and alert people, etc. So, and finally, some sort of a regional entrepreneurial uh, activities, and this is the kind of thing to be harnessed. A local uh, a rehabilitation home, elder care home, found that basically viscosity of hot drinks is an issue. You have to increase the viscosity to uh, prevent uh, dysphagia and, dysphagia and uh, aspiration pneumonia. And so uh, this company just invented a vending machine that adds some thickener to it uh, in various degrees. And this kind of thing got national news and then various places are going to start making something similar to it. So uh, the bottom line here is that the current trajectories of technology are driven primarily by the private sector, but in response to the vast and deep market demands in specific areas caused by demographic uh, extreme, extreme change. Uh, the government has behind, been behind it, uh, but not in the old school industrial policy development state kind of thing with lots of uh, funding. It's more uh, cheerleading and providing legitimacy and cover for corporate decision making. So it is moving it forward. And the current administration is continuing this pattern, although there are several other things going on that are distracting it. So I think the trajectory is still there. So, uh, so finally, uh, this is an interesting opportunity to set global technological trajectories and Japan is a place to look for from other places to see uh, what's developing. Uh, and a possible hypothesis dynamic that comes out of it is, is the areas of intense labor scarcity shaping human substitute AI and skill augmenting uh, intelligence augmentation IA, uh, versus those with high unemployment. And this will be especially true in the post COVID world. Thank you. Thank you all very much. And uh, I hope that many of our listeners today will also be interested in the written chapters when they come out. So if anyone has questions, I've gathered some already, but feel free any of our listeners to put additional questions in the Q&A. We'll have a, just um, a few minutes left in our webinar now to discuss some of those questions. So first I wanted to ask our panelists each to reflect a little bit. It was mentioned, um, that um, additional investments in population health contributed to the demographic transition, including um, better in utero and nutrition, as Jim Farrah mentioned, as well as um, social innovations at the community level in Korea. And as Kenji mentioned, um, technology then uh, um, being tailored to the needs of an older workforce. So across the life course. Um, so, and that, as Jim has mentioned, it helped to sort of mitigate the negative impacts of an older workforce in an older society. So I wanted to invite your thoughts, um, particularly in light of the pandemic and what we've learned since then about the longer term impacts of this demographic change in Asia. Is there anything we've learned about public and private sector working together on social innovation or technology to provide a global public good that is also related to this topic, longer term demographic change and innovation. Uh, just go back through our panelists if you have any thoughts on that very broad question um, and come to any final questions from the audience. So uh, Jim Fair, first. Well, one thing that comes to mind is I think the pandemic really pointed out that the importance of actually where you're sitting is a lot less important than we thought it was. And uh, you know, I'm I'm in Hanover, New Hampshire. We're spread out above Korea and and at Stanford. And and I think 
you know, we talk about um, some of the rural areas having difficulties, and one could imagine that the pandemic will open up some doors in that regard, that um, rural areas might become more attractive. And certainly in the U.S., I, you know, you, you've got pretty, pretty but remote places that might uh, all of a sudden be, become, Vail, Colorado, all of a sudden becomes a much more viable place to have a high-end job than, um, than it used to, perhaps, pre-pandemic. And so that's one aspect that I, I think is the pandemic may actually, you know, result in some big changes. The other thing is that the, the kind of work flexibility that has been unlocked, I think, by the pandemic, I think is going to matter. And, and one thing that when Kenji was talking that, that struck me was, and in talking about the rural doctors in particular, is that you know, one of the ways you can deal with the demographic problem, at least in part, is if you're in a society that isn't fully implementing using women in all the various roles, I mean, to some degree, you can, uh, you can increase your population in some ways by fixing that problem. And I think having the ability for work to be more flexible um, certainly aids that along. I mean, obviously, there's more to it than just that, but that is, um, it's a force multiplier. And so those are thoughts that, that, that come to mind. Great. Thank you. Professor Park, anything you wanted to mention? Uh, especially uh, in relation with the recent dramatic, you know, uh, experience we are uh, facing nowadays. Uh, uh, well, yeah, I would like to uh, see some positive or hopeful, you know, side or the pin, pin, pandemic effect on the demo, demographic uh, challenges we are now facing. Well, as Professor Wayne mentioned, I think the pandemic, uh, well, uh, seems to be uh, accelerating, accelerated rating the social challenges, social changes or uh, technological, you know, movement. Uh, which uh, uh, well uh, are, are having their own uh, course, but the problem is the pandemic is uh, well uh, removing all the barriers or all the obstacles for uh, developing our uh, human potential uh, in living uh, more you know productive society. So uh, well in uh, uh, facing those kind of uh, uh, issues related with the negative side of the aging society, uh, we need more uh, uh, pay attention to the qualitative you know changes. For example, uh, investing more on the on enhancing human capability or human potential. Uh, as we all see it, I think that our uh, book, Will, uh, will be a small contribution for suggesting people that uh, we have more you know, things to do and, and also uh, well, uh, those kind of various innovations which are happening uh, well, in face of uh, the, uh, this kind of great social challenges will benefit for the next you know, uh, generation or those countries we, who, who are now, uh, who, are, who will face similar kind of uh, uh, population uh, transformation like us. Thank you. Thank you. And Kenji, would you like to add some thoughts? Yeah, thanks. So uh, one thing in Japan uh, is, I haven't, I haven't seen the Korean numbers, but in 2020, fewer people in Japan passed away total than 2019. Uh, because of the various measures, which means that this is everything became more extreme because the number of older people increased and fewer uh, disappeared. So, so it's an accelerant on the one hand. On the second hand, uh, the the remote work because the pandemic compared to the U.S. was a very very low number of deaths. Uh, the remote work didn't get implemented as thoroughly or as long as here. So a surprisingly rapid return to reasonable normalcy uh, happened. And so while it did open up a lot of possibilities, it was a little less than I had hoped. But then we get to the third hand. It's a, a three-handed three monster. The third hand is uh, women everywhere seem to have borne the brunt of a lot of uh, the burden of when there were lockdowns or various uh, schools shutting down, et cetera. So when things open up and there's a modicum of remote work possible, uh, is it 
the perfect opportunity for women to then, uh, once the, uh, we mostly get vaccinated and the uh, various emergencies go down, uh, start to enter the labor force in new ways and different ways. Uh, and to what degree will that hit elderly populations? There was a nice question about the gig economy. So there's the being pushed into the gig economy and then the voluntarily joining uh, later on for tasks. So uh, several dynamics at work that are very interesting. Great, thank you. So um, another question related, it came up and thank you for already addressing the gig economy question. If uh, Jim or Arjunchik have thoughts on that, please add those. And I would also uh, throw out there, um, building upon the point about um, the impact of the pandemic on women and in the labor force and labor force participation. As Jim mentioned, of course, if you can bring that part of the population back into productive um, part of a labor force participation that can help to mitigate the demographic change. On the other hand, um, we've seen a lot of impact that may affect the careers of the women having been taking care of children during the lockdown or um, not having as much of an attachment to the labor force given the kinds of positions that they occupy. And Korea and Japan having many highly educated women that were never necessarily part of the career workforce. So when um, the economies come out of lockdown, will there be a concerted effort to try to make up for that and to push it further along? or not, do you think? Particularly, I'm asking about um, Korea and Japan's cases, if you would like to comment on that. Any thoughts? Well, especially uh, in Korea, as you mentioned, uh, the negative impact uh, on, on labor force and uh, employment market uh, are very much is, uh, concentrated on uh, women. Uh, uh, well, uh, during last year, the most of the uh, informal uh, workers or uh, well, uh, th those people who are uh, less privileged in labor market had to uh, well, face those kind of burden uh, were too much. And also uh, the government, uh, uh, of course, uh, well, uh, acknowledge that and are trying to augment their burden by, by you know, uh, well, uh, introducing yeah, well, uh, well, historic measures for for those people helping those people in various kinds of uh, ways. So those kind of consecutive, you know, uh, emergency measures by the government uh, is very interesting. On and also, I think the the we need to see how those kind of government measures or uh, emergency policies can be uh, transformed into some kind of. Uh, institutional uh, system uh, when uh, we are uh, you know recovering from uh, the pandemic and I hope uh, our experience during pandemic will uh, cast us a lot of uh, future implications for a better future thank you Great, yeah, so there's a technology piece and a politics piece the technology piece that's very interesting is that uh, uh, Komatsu and others are, are going full steam ahead to de develop systems for remote operation of heavy machinery and their vision. And they're working with Silicon Valley firms and others and startups that are good at using um, a neurology for artificial limbs to be able to understand the haptics and feedback for uh, true uh, remote operation of say construction equipment. And if we think about the labor shortage of people going to construction sites that's severe, and if it becomes more severe, then the type of labor force they can get for that are the people sort of like the doctor uh, uh, analogy. You can have people with young children that then go into daycare at the first floor and then they go up to the third floor and then it can be a mother of two and then she is operating machinery very far away that's in a place that's hard to get to. And then when a shift is done, it goes to someone else. Uh, and so this kind of unlocking technologically of the labor force is full steam ahead. At the same time, at least in Japan, there's the politics. Uh, we might get a big reaction to, uh, there was a recent big scandal where the Olympic Committee uh, chairman uh, said that there are too many women in the, uh, uh, 
committees, then they take a long time because they speak. The reaction to this was severe uh, public uh, sentiment. And of course, you know, true rage, ranging from true rage to others uh, uh, a little less so. But then if this becomes a political issue, then getting how to get women more into politics and management can become a electoral issue. If it becomes in that logic where people have to promise women as a constituency uh, who have not been as a constituency catered towards in this way before, if that kind of dynamic uh, hits on, then the technology, the politics, and then the post-pandemic uh, freeing up this, we could, we could um, end on an optimistic note uh, for there. Thank you. And finally, maybe back over to Jim. I know you've also written about the role of um, sharing of labor within the home as well as in the workforce and uh, Korea and Japan's um, as examples of the different stages of that fertility transition. <laughs> so what are some of the important lessons? Can the world learn from Japan and Korea? What are they learning? What's the most important lesson for improving productivity going forward? Thank you. Uh, well, um, it's a, that's a fascinating question. Um, I mean, I think one thing we have to keep in mind is that productivity and technology aren't the same thing. Um, so the technologies that, that Kenji is describing, all of which are, are fantastic that are being developed in Japan, um, you know, you could see those being used in Iowa as well. You could, you could imagine combines being driven by people remotely. And I'm sure, I suspect we, if we're not doing that already, we're getting darn close. Um, and, and so when we think about technology and productivity, they're kind of two different things. And a lot of my thinking about the productivity problem is um, it's more of a, a, an ability of workforces to work at that edge of technology. It's a way for them to be efficient and productive. And, you know, the macroeconomist in me wants to remind everyone that productivity means a lot of different things. Um, productivity is not just that, you know, you're using the fanciest computers. Productivity means, uh, you know, countries that have less, less lunch breaks are going to be more productive in the sense that for every eight hours they work, they're going to get more actual work out of people. And so the way societies are organized matters a lot here. And so a lot of what I've written about in terms of demographics involve things like management quality, um, which doesn't have anything to do with technology, but is crucial for implementing technology and for using technology efficiently. And I, I think the, the interactions between those two are going to be fascinating. And I, just to, to circle a little bit back to what we were talking about with COVID and the, the one thing that, that both Kenji and, and June Chi's part, um, answers reminded me of is just how country specific all of this is that you know the experience of even across the United States has got a huge amount of heterogeneity um, Europe looks different than the US and uh, East Asia looks very different than than all of it and so um, in terms of thinking about how all this plays out over the next you know couple of years um, it may play out really differently in different contexts and I think both of the answers that came after mine did a nice job of thinking about that well, thank you all very much. Uh, thank you all for joining us today for the webinar, and we hope that you will be interested in reading the book to learn more. Stay well, and thank you again, everyone.